Satyajit, good to have you with us on News Click. We're going to discuss some of the issues which today are really making people rather worried about the future of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I'm not going to discuss specifically the Indian scenario. Uh, that we will reserve for another day. But broadly, when we look at the COVID-19 pandemic, the two questions that come to mind is that, is there a quick solution we are going to get either in terms of prophylactic or in terms of a treatment? And the second is, of course, that when are we going to get the vaccine? So these are two questions I'm going to give discuss with you. First is the question of the prophylactic come uh, curative part of it, which I think has a shorter timeline if we can get it. Um, yeah. Keep in mind that a vaccine itself is, of course, um, the best prophylactic. Of course. Um, that said, um, if one if one leaves out the vaccine for the moment from uh, prophylaxis, then what one is talking about is the kind of drug prophylaxis, um, and 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 the example that everybody is um, hyping currently, based on our experience with malaria is, uh, of course, chloroquine. Okay. Um, so and the famous three, British sorry, drinking gin for, and tonic. For, um, so there are three, uh, you, you, would, you would need um, a very, very substantial quantity, shall we say politely, um, uh, of a multitude of gin and tonics every day in order to get the dose that you need. But um, that apart, there are three issues because of which people are talking about chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine prophylaxis. One is that, as I said, we have some experience with uh, chloroquine prophylaxis in malaria. So we are used to thinking about chloroquine in a prophylactic, in a drug-based prophylactic regimen. The second is that Chloroquine is known to be um, an odd molecule that works on a wide variety of biological processes. And one of those happens to be um, broadly related to inflammation. Um, you will remember that chloroquine is used uh, at least in some uh, efforts to limit uh, the symptoms of um, immune inflammatory diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and the basis for that seems to be uh, that it has some sort of an anti-inflammatory um, activity, to put it very broadly. Um, there are speculations about how, how it works, although there's no really hard proof of how it works in those situations. And the third has come about because people have been trying drug repurposing for antiviral effects in a variety of uh, um, contexts ever since the first of the three major coronavirus out family outbreaks began um, close on 20 years ago which is with what we used to call then as the SARS coronavirus or SARS-CoV and now we have begun to call SARS-CoV-1. And there was some evidence that when you took a situation where you took human cells, you put the SARS coronavirus onto human cells, it grew and you could stop that growth with a whole range of repurposable drugs that included chloroquine. And it's on that basis that people over the last two months, three months, have been trying chloroquine for those sorts of tests. And it is as a result of that usage that the 
clinical use of chloroquine in patients has been attempted and reported. And you will note that I'm not using the, the phrase clinical trials because there has been no proper clinical trial of chloroquine. Simply, clinical usage has been reported. The thing to remember is that typically, in order to work well as a drug with a defined test tube efficacy, the potency of the drug has to be pretty high. The potency of chloroquine for SARS-CoV-2, which is our current epidemic virus, is not very high the reported potency. Okay. Um, and we can, get it, we can get into the technicalities of just how much, but the reality is it's not very high. So it's and not the it's antiviral not property that could help in this case, but could be the anti-inflammatory property. We don't, we don't know. Now, let me, let me press that further. There are two separate um, time windows during the infection of an individual with SARS-CoV-2 in which we can intervene. The first is very early during infection. And what, what we would like early during infection is for the relatively limited virus load to be rapidly eliminated. And it's in that situation that you would like an antiviral effect. Either a direct antiviral effect or an effect that increases the body's own antiviral inflammatory response, accelerates it, so to say. So chloroquine's anti direct antiviral effect may work at that point, but as I said, for that the potency seems to be fairly low. On the other hand, we also want people who are in hospital with severe infections to be treated with, with something other than simply supportive therapy. And that's a situation in which chloroquine will have two separate effects, if at all it is effective. One effect will be the direct antiviral effect, but the other effect will be this more nebulous anti-inflammatory effect. And because people's lungs are being inflamed and affected, limiting the inflammation as well as controlling virus growth is useful. So, so let me interrupt for a minute. That, so let me interrupt for a minute. That what you are saying is that the SARS-CoV-2 has really these two phases. One in which you have a viral infection. That's a primary issue at that point. Later, when you get an inflammation of the lung, you could also have co-bacterial infection at that point. So at that point, the regime might change because you need to address the issue of the bacterial infection, any other infection, as well as take care of the inflammation of the lung, which is what is causing the seriousness of the pneumonia, which probably you are in at that point. That, that's absolutely correct. Those, those, those all become major contributory factors that need to be dealt with at that point stage of the illness. And that is the more critical and hospital so, phase. That's right. And that's where the attempted usage of chloroquine has been made so far. Okay, okay. The chloroquine as it is as from my scene uh, trial that the the trial or the use, the clinical use of that is done the, the French the case. Sort of, yes. yes. Okay. Um, so that, that's where we stand with chloroquine. So, um, you know, in theory, one can sort of wave one's hands and make all sorts of hopeful speculations. But in reality, there isn't really good basis for thinking about chloroquine prophylaxis as being a major factor. I may okay. turn out to be wrong, but at the moment, we certainly have, have no evidence to show that. For Coming this. back to the antivirals, because what you're talking about, before it goes to stage two, 
is there a quick antiviral that we can put into play? And some of the anti-AIDS drugs are being used in this, in this context. And also an anti-Ebola drug, which is uh, Gilead's uh, drug, which is also being sought to be used. And there also the part of the yes. drug trials, interferon is also being used. Interferon beta version is yes. also being used. So yes. all of these are to attempt to control the viral part of the infection. So in, in early during infection, there are two ways in which, as I said, we can uh, attempt to help the body deal with the virus. One is to use direct antivirals. Um, and I'll come to that in a second. The other is to increase the body's antiviral inflammatory response. The body has a number of different inflammatory responses. There is the one of those categories is an antiviral inflammatory response. And one can increase the antiviral inflammatory response. So using agulated uh, interferon alpha or interferon beta, um, which is what you refer to, is, is that um, pathway. Talking about the direct antivirals, there are three categories of direct antivirals that are being um, thought about. One is, as I said, simply repurposing drugs simply by taking a cell in tissue culture, putting virus, letting the virus infect the cells, and then you trying every drug you, you have access to to see if that drug interrupts every known already licensed drug and seeing whether that drug stops or reduces virus growth in cells. And if it does, then that's a... a Potential, um, potential repurposable drug. And there are quite a few of these that we have already begun. Also, that short circuit the drug development process because you don't have to do safety trials Correct. and all of that again. Correct. So there's already a longish list of such drugs that a number of labs across the world um, have developed. You will appreciate that this kind of research requires the test. You need cells growing in a test tube and you need the actual infectious virus to put on the cells, which means you need infectious virus, which means you need the containment for the infectious virus. Now, drug discovery against viruses has dealt with this problem for a long time and one can use a viral mimic for this purpose. Last week, people have, for the first time that I have seen, reported such a viral mimic-based test. And I'm hopeful they've said in their paper that they are willing to share these reagents widely. Um, and therefore, I'm hopeful that with that, major efforts at both repurposing already licensed drugs as well as trying to find really potent new drugs can be done the world over from a wide variety of sources in a wide variety of public sector, public interest laboratories. So that's one source for antivirals. A second source for antivirals is, as I said, this is not the first time that we've met the coronavirus family in a major a disease outbreak. Both SARS and MERS, the so-called um, colonially named Middle Eastern respiratory virus, um, were coronaviruses. And people have been working on specifically drugs for them for quite some time. Some of those have gone through preclinical work as well as, as, well as um, perhaps safety, human safety. So that's a second source because something that works against a related virus is likely to work against SARS-CoV-2. And the third is people are simply taking virus antivirals against all sorts of RNA viruses since SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus. Um, and saying, let's see if it works. And the list amongst those 
is obviously the HIV, um, anti-HIV drugs, as well as others such as uh, Zika and, you know, all sorts of And the anti Ebola drug of Gilead. So, so those are the sources from where antivirals come. Um, I am not certain of just how well direct antivirals will work based on our experience with other effective antiviral drugs in viral infections, direct antiviral drugs. So let me give you um, two examples. One is the example of Tamiflu, which um, those of us who are old enough remember from 10 years ago. Um, yeah, and, much older uh, than that, Satyajit, not just 10 years back. So, so t- Tamiflu um, was, is a fairly important drug against influenza viruses. And yet, in the clinical setting, it really needed to be given very early in order to limit the severity of illness. Second example that I can give you is that of um, acyclovir, which is a direct antiviral drug against herpes outbreaks, skin her- herpetic outbreaks. Once again, unless you start the medication very, very early, as soon as symptoms arise, the drug doesn't, the drug is not, shall we say, the kind of magic bullet as an antiviral drug, that effective antibiotics are against bacterial infections. And that difference needs to be kept in mind when we decide what to expect even from effective direct antiviral drugs. But and there are coming reasons back. of the differences in viral and bacterial biology for this, but broadly, this is what we need to keep in mind. But coming back to the question, that if we do get any of this work, even if it's in limited sense, which can bring down the severity of the infection, even that would be a bonus. It might stop a lot of the hospital uh, admissions and the seriousness of the case developing. So even that would really help. No question. But there are two major bottlenecks that we as as communities and uh, when we think about public policy should keep in mind. One is the fact that this is an epidemic. And it's an epidemic where all of us across the world are potentially susceptible. And that means that the sheer demand per week on the amounts of a drug across the world is going to be monumental. Which means that we need two things. We need national level regulatory authorities to work rapidly to license these drugs to to give the permissions for usage of these drugs. And secondly, we need the manufacturing, not just capability, but actual manufacturing to provide these drugs as medications at scale in the market. Yes. But for the company, and those are not going to be trivial issues. problems. They are not non-trivial, no question. But if we have a drug, then we can talk about how to manufacture it and how to scale it up. If we don't have it, of course, we go nowhere. And then depending on whether it's a small molecule or it's a complex biologics, big molecule, of course, you have completely different scales of the problem. So scaling is a second issue that we would come to, but it would still be a happy problem to solve because it means we have something in the kitty at the moment. We don't yes. really have anything in the kitty, and that's the stage we are right in. Uh, so that's why the concern really is, if we not do, uh, if we look at the future, then if we have the, at least some drug which should work, even partially, it will make the possibility of treatment 
and then it becomes really a manufacturing and a scaling issue, it moves beyond science into what I will call public policy, public health, and your drug global infrastructure, and the kind of global policies then that we put in place. Coming back to the... He does. Coming back to the issue of, okay, what you've said is mixed. We have some hope, but lots of tests, and maybe something will come out. Some, let's say some light, maybe partially at the moment, but things are very, very uncertain in terms of the science that we are seeing. That's broadly the picture that we have. Some leads, but we have to really see whether they pan out. Coming to the issue of vaccines, well, is there a chance of getting a vaccine? Because you yourself just now said that vaccines are going to be the real issue. Is there a uh, 12 months to 18 months is what is being said. But I remember Soumya Swamina, Swaminathan saying at least one and a half months back that vaccines are 12 to 18 months away. Now, this 12 months don't seem to move, but our timeline is continuously moving. Can't we say now it's about 10 to 14 months away? <laughs> so, so, there are... Let me say something about the uh, scientific difficulties, uncertainties about a vaccine, um, which also connects, incidentally, to therapeutics. And that is, at the moment, we are not certain whether we make protective immune responses against SARS-CoV-2. And it's essential to know that before being certain that we can make a vaccine easily. Now, over the past 10 days, evidence has begun to come about. Some in humans, at least one uh, study in monkeys, where it begins to appear that not only do we make an immune response to the virus, that by itself is not surprising, but that that immune response, in the case of humans, actually blocks the virus from infecting cells in a test tube, which is very useful information. And in the monkeys... Let me break it down. It, okay, so go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. In monkeys, go ahead. It prevents the monkey from being reinfected. Okay. Now, just to break so, it down for our audience, what you mean is that we at the moment do not know how much the protection extends after you are infected and you are cured. So you may be reinfected in one month, two months, three months, twelve months. This is the information we do, did not have earlier. Now we are get, starting to get no, some no, information. No. no? Okay. No. What we didn't know is whether we are protected at all. Okay. We now know that it's more than likely that we are. The question you are asking, how is, a, is, is the next level question, how long are we protected? Okay. We still have no idea. Okay. okay. But quite frankly, from a, from a vaccine point of view, the answer to the first question was critical and important. The answer to the duration question is not that critical. Think about it this way. Flu vaccines are seasonal vaccines. We take flu vaccines, or more correctly, those of us who are fortunate enough in socioeconomic terms to have access to a flu vaccine, take flu vaccines annually. So, it's not impossible for us to make do with a vaccine that provides for short-term protection. Because if we can vaccinate a sufficiently large fraction of the population, then we can break transmission cycles. Okay. And we can keep transmission cycles under, under limits by repeated vaccination. So what you're saying is... That's why the first question is important rather than the second. Second one. The duration would be, if it lasts only 15 days, then we have to vaccinate every 15 days. That's unlikely from you. So that's extremely unlikely. unlikely. It's, it's, it's a question of 
Is it going to last for a few months or a few years? And that, while important and interesting, is not a make or break question for a vaccine. In terms of trying to stop the epidemic, it means that we have to vaccinate three times instead of once a year. That's what it would be, what it amount to. And once you've broken the transmission cycle, we have controlled the pandemic. That's that. This is the basic message that you are giving. So some some yeah. good de developments right now. The four monkeys, macaque in China, who are who underwent that test, the test, uh, the case that you were talking yeah. about, it's a preprint right now, and I don't know whether any other cases have been reported. Well, the, as I said, the human antibodies from people who have recovered seem to provide uh, some indications of protection. Okay. So I think that the vaccine trials that are that have been accelerated, that are already in safety trials, are, in my judgment, more than likely to succeed. So There's there a whole range of right. vaccine designs yeah. that are already under trial. So there are two drug trials. One is a mRNA drug trial, which is being done by the Chinese. And the other is a, the US mRNA uh, trial, which is also listed by the WHO. And there is a German one, That's which right. is supposed to come into uh, quickly into, uh, into on stream again. Three trials that I it can think of. There's also a, um, a, um, a vaccine designed in Oxford in the United Kingdom. Okay. which is on the verge of uh, entering trials. And there are two um, or three broad designs of vaccines that people are trying. One is to inject mRNA or DNA that codes for the viral proteins, but rather than making the protein and then injecting it into the body as a vaccine, the mRNA or DNA is directly injected into the body, allowing the body to make the viral proteins and to generate the immune response against it. That's one category. The second category is to make the viral protein, the spike protein most commonly, and to formulate it exactly like a tetanus vaccine, and to inject that and generate um, an immune response. A third, which again has been repurposed from a SARS vaccine, is to take another virus to put SARS-CoV-2 genes into that virus, so an adenovirus, and to use that as a vaccine. And all of these are under... under um, I would say advanced preclinical um, development and likely to go into human clinical trials over the coming weeks rather than months. So, how fast can we crash the development cycle and ensure there will be safety or from the vaccine itself as well as efficacy? How long should it can it now take, given the scale of the you know, pandemic and the fact that everybody is now concerned? So my guess is that by the end of this calendar year, we will have clear evidence about at least one, if not more, of these um, vaccine candidates generating good, stable and good and stable immune responses that show markers of protection. How rapidly we can begin manufacture to, to a global scale, how quickly we can go through the regulatory processes that every country has of its own, become downstream manufacturing and policy issues, which the scientific and technological leadership is very loath to predict. And in general, I suspect that that is why they are all being circumspect about how long it's going to take to have a vaccine in the marketplace. Okay. Okay. Again, I remind you of what happened with the SARS vaccine. With SARS, 
scientists and technologists began to develop a vaccine and had come through preclinical studies, at which point it became apparent that it wasn't spreading enough for anybody to buy the vaccine. So back the vaccines went onto the shelf. And in fact, some of those have been dusted off and quickly re-engineered for SARS-CoV-2. So it, it, in that sense, this is not going back to the shelves quickly because the scale at which this is spreading is very clear. It's that and we are not in the SARS control uh, phase at all, SARS-CoV control, which the globally we managed to do for whatever reasons it might be. The last question, I know that I'm taking a lot of your time. The last question, is the cycle, since we are entering summer, even in the, uh, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, do you think this is going to interrupt the cycle of transmission? Because it does seem to show that tropical areas are having a lower transmission. Frankly, I really don't know an answer to that question. I don't think anybody does. I don't think there is any reasonable evidence on which to base even a, even a quasi-realistic guess. On that question, we're just going to have to wait and brace ourselves and see. The, um, the, the geographical, geoclimatic patterns that you're pointing to, at this point, could just as well be the, uh, the, 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 the swirling statistical probabilities that typically um, epidemics show. Or the travel. So on that one, I'm, I have no um, easy answer to give. Or more closely following the travel patterns. If we're densely connected, the epidemic is likely to spread faster through those routes. Could be. You don't That's know. Certain. Okay. So what you're saying is just could be the artifact of the statistics rather than the real cause and effect. That that's a possibility. Okay. Not we much don't. not much hope for the next twelve months uh, that you're holding out, but maybe some improvements on the at least on the medical front in terms of repurposing drugs quickly. That seems to be our quickest bet. Let me put it this way. By the end of the year, we will have a number of effective ways. Okay. So in the long run, we are okay. It's the question is how to handle the short run, which is next nine months, not as long as Lord Keynes. In the long run, we are dead model. So only nine months will be in a much no. better stage to give a definitive answer where we are. Thank you very much, Satyajit, for being with us and telling us all about the challenges that we face medically. We are not talking of socially, economically, none of these issues, because that's a completely different ballgame altogether. And we will come back and discuss this another day. Thank you very much for being with us. This is all the time we have in NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and see our other programs. Thank <laughs> you.